Astronomy in China has a long history, beginning from the Shang Dynasty Chinese Bronze Age. Star names later categorized in the 28 mansions have been found on oracle bones unearthed at Anyang, dating back to the Middle Shang Dynasty, and the mansion Shu, Su Systems Nucleus seems to have taken shape by the time of the ruler Wu Ding BCE. .Detailed records of astronomical observations began during the Warring States period 4th century BCE and flourished from the Han period onward. Chinese astronomy was equatorial, centered as it was on close observation of circumpolar stars, and was based on different principles from those prevailing in traditional Western astronomy, where heliacal risings and settings of zodiac constellations formed the basic ecliptic framework. Needham has described the ancient Chinese as the most persistent and accurate observers of celestial phenomena anywhere in the world before the Islamic astronomers. Some elements of Indian astronomy reached China with the expansion of Buddhism after the Eastern Han Dynasty 25 to 220 CE, but the most detailed incorporation of Indian astronomical thought occurred during the Tang Dynasty 618 to 907 CE, when numerous Indian astronomers took up residence in the Chinese capital and Chinese scholars such as the tantric Buddhist monk and mathematician Yi Xing, mastered its system. Islamic astronomers collaborated closely with their Chinese colleagues during the Yuan dynasty, and, after a period of relative decline during the Ming dynasty, astronomy was revitalized under the stimulus of Western cosmology and technology after the Jesuits established their missions. The telescope was introduced in the 17th century. In 1669, the Peking Observatory was completely redesigned and refitted under the direction of Ferdinand Verbiest. Today, China continues to be active in astronomy, with many observatories and its own space program. <laughs> Early history Purpose of astronomical observations in the past One of the main functions was for the purpose of timekeeping. The Chinese used a lunisolar calendar, but, because the cycles of the sun and the moon are different, intercalation had to be done. The Chinese calendar was considered to be a symbol of a dynasty. As dynasties would rise and fall, astronomers and astrologers of each period would often prepare a new calendar to be made, with observations for that purpose. Astrological divination was also an important part of astronomy. Astronomers took careful note of guest stars, which suddenly appeared among the fixed stars. The supernova that created the Crab Nebula observed in 1054, now known as the SN 1054, is an example of a guest star observed by Chinese astronomers, recorded also by the Arab astronomers, although it was not recorded by their European contemporaries. Ancient astronomical records of phenomena like comets and supernovae are sometimes used in modern astronomical studies. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Indian influence. Indian astronomy reached China with the expansion of Buddhism during the later Han 25 to 220 CE. Further translation of Indian works on astronomy was completed in China by the Three Kingdoms era 220 to 265 CE. However, the most detailed incorporation of Indian astronomy occurred only during the Tang dynasty 618 to 907 CE when a number of Chinese scholars such as Yi Xing were versed both in Indian and Chinese astronomy. A system of Indian astronomy was recorded in China as Juzi Li 718 CE, the author of which was an Indian by the name of Qutan Zita, a translation of Devanagari Gautama Siddha, the director of the Tang Dynasty's National Astronomical Observatory. During the 8th century, the astronomical table of signs by the Indian astronomer and mathematician, Aryabhata, were translated into the Chinese Astronomical and Mathematical Book of the Treatise on Astrology of the Kaiyuan Era, Kaiyuan Zhenjing, compiled in 718 CE during the Tang Dynasty. The Kaiyuan Zhenjing was compiled by Gautama Siddha, an astronomer and astrologer born in Chang'an, and whose family was originally from India. He was also notable for his translation of the Navagraha calendar into Chinese. Gautama Siddha introduced Indian numerals with zero Ling in 718 in China as a replacement of counting rods. In 3rd century CE, the Matanaga Avada was translated into Chinese. Although the original is believed to date earlier. 
It gives the lengths of monthly shadows of a 12 inch gnomon, which is the standard parameter of Indian astronomy. The work also mentions the 28 Indian nakshatras. In the beginning of the 2nd century, Sardula Karnavadana was translated into Chinese several times. This work contains the usual Sanskrit names of the 28 nakshatras, starting with Kirtika. From the 1st century onward, Lalitavistara was translated into Chinese several times. It is in this work that the famous Buddhist centesimal scale counting occurs during the dialogue between Prince Gotamond and the mathematician Arjuna. The first series of counts ends with Talaksana equals 1053, beyond which eight more Ganana series are mentioned. Atomic scale counting is also mentioned. The Mahaprajnaparamita Sastra of Nagarjuna, second century, was translated into Chinese by Kumarajiva in the early fifth century. Point one six. The astronomical parameters mentioned in this translation are comparable to those given in the Vedanga Jyotisha. Indian system of numeration appeared in the Chinese work Ta Pao Chi Ching, Maharatnakuta Sutra, translated by Upasunya in 541 CE The Chinese translations of the following works are mentioned in the Sui Shu or official history of the Sui dynasty 7th century Polo Men Thien Wen Ching Brahmanical astronomical classic in 21 books Polo Men Che Che Xian Gen Thien Wen Shuo Astronomical theories OF Brahman a Che Che Xian Gen in 30 books Po Lo Men Thien Ching Brahmanical Heavenly Theory in one book. Mo Teng Chia Ching Huang Tu Map of Heaven and Earth in the Matangi Sutra in one book. Po Lo Men Suan Ching Brahmanical Arithmetical Classic in three books. Po Lo Men Suan Fa Brahmanical Arithmetical Rules in one book. Po Lo Men Ying Yang Suan Ching Brahmanical Method of Calculating Time Although these translations are lost, they were also mentioned in other Sources Cosmology The Chinese developed three cosmological models The Gai Tian, or Hemispherical Dome, model conceived the heavens as a hemisphere lying over a dome-shaped Earth. The second cosmological model, associated with the Hun Tien school, saw the heavens as a celestial sphere not unlike the spherical models developed in the Greek and Hellenistic traditions. The third cosmology, associated with the Zan Yi school, viewed the heavens as infinite in extent and the celestial bodies as floating about at rare intervals, and the speed of the luminaries depends on their individual natures, which shows they are not attached to anything. Constellations The divisions of the sky began with the Northern Dipper and the 28 mansions. In 1977, a lacquer box was excavated from the tomb of Yi, the Marquis of Zung, in Suishen, Hubei Province. Names of the 28 lunar mansions were found on the cover of the box, proving that the use of this classification system was made before 433 BCE. As lunar mansions have such an ancient origin, the meanings of most of their names have become obscure. Even worse, the name of each lunar mansion consists of only one Chinese word, the meaning of which could vary at different times in history. The meanings of the names are still under discussion. Besides the 28 lunar mansions, most constellations are based on the works of Shi Shen Fu and Ganda, who were astrologists during the period of Warring States 481 BCE to 221 BCE in China. In the late period of the Ming dynasty, the agricultural scientist and mathematician Xu Guangqi (1562–1633 introduced 23 additional constellations near to the celestial South Pole, which are based on star catalogues from the West. See Matteo Ricci. Topic: <laughs> Star catalogues and maps. Star catalogues In the 4th century BCE, the two Chinese astronomers responsible for the earliest information going into the star catalogues were Shi Shen and Ganda of the Warring States period. These books appeared to have lasted until the 6th century, but were lost after that. A number of books share similar names, often quoted and named after them. These texts should not be confused with the original catalogues written by them. Notable works that helped preserve the contents include 
Wu Xian, Wu Xian has been one of the astronomers in debate. He is often represented as one of the three schools astronomical tradition, along with Gan and Shi. The Chinese classic text Star Manual of Master Wu Xian, Wu Xian Xing Jing and its authorship is still in dispute, because it mentioned names of twelve countries that did not exist in the Shang dynasty, the era of which it was supposed to have been written. Moreover, it was customary in the past for the Chinese to forge works of notable scholars, as this could lead to a possible explanation for the inconsistencies found. Wu Xian is generally mentioned as the astronomer who lived many years before Gan and Shi. The Han Dynasty astronomer and inventor Zhang Heng CE not only catalogued some 2,500 different stars, but also recognized more than 100 different constellations. Zhang Heng also published his work Ling Xian, a summary of different astronomical theories in China at the time. In the subsequent period of the Three Kingdoms 220 to 280 CE, Chen Zhou, Zhou combined the work of his predecessors, forming another star catalog. This time, 283 constellations and 1464 stars were listed. The astronomer Guo Shoujin of the Yuan Dynasty 1279 to 1368 CE created a new catalog, which was believed to contain thousands of stars. Unfortunately, many of the documents of that period were destroyed, including that of Shoujin. Imperial Astronomical Instruments Yi Shang Kao Sheung was published in 1757 and contains 3,083 stars exactly. <laughs> Star maps The Chinese drew many maps of stars in the past centuries. It is debatable as to which counts as the oldest star maps, since pottery and old artifacts can also be considered star maps. One of the oldest existent star maps in printed form is from Su Song's 1020-1101 CE Celestial Atlas of 1092 CE, which was included in the horological treatise on his clock tower. The most famous one is perhaps the Dunhuang map found in Dunhuang, Gansu. Uncovered by the British archaeologist Mark Orlstein in 1907, the star map was brought to the British Museum in London. The map was drawn on paper and represents the complete sky, with more than 1,350 stars. Although ancient Babylonians and Greeks also observed the sky and catalogued stars, no such complete record of the stars may exist or survive. Hence, this is the oldest chart of the skies at present. According to recent studies, the map may date the manuscript to as early as the 7th century CE Tang Dynasty. Scholars believe the star map dating from 705 to 710 CE, which is the reign of Emperor Zhongzong of Tang. There are some texts monthly ordinances, Yu Ling describing the movement of the sun among the sky each month, which was not based on the observation at that time. Solar and lunar eclipses Chinese astronomers recorded 1,600 observations of solar and lunar eclipses from 750 BCE. The ancient Chinese astronomer Shi Shen Florida, 4th century BCE was aware of the relation of the Moon in a solar eclipse, as he provided instructions in his writing to predict them by using the relative positions of the Moon and the Sun. The radiating influence theory, where the moon's light was nothing but a reflection of the sun's, was supported by the mathematician and music theorist Jing Fang (78–37 BCE), yet opposed by the Chinese philosopher Wang Chong (27–97 CE), who made clear in his writing that this theory was nothing new. Jing Fang wrote, "The moon and the planets are yin; they have shape but no light. This they receive only when the sun illuminates them." The former masters regarded the sun as round like a crossbow bullet, and they thought the moon had the nature of a mirror. Some of them recognized the moon as a ball too. Those parts of the moon which the sun illuminates look bright, those parts which it does not, remain dark. The ancient Greeks had known this as well, since Parmenides and Aristotle supported the theory of the moon shining because of reflected light. The Chinese astronomer and inventor Zhang Heng CE wrote of both solar eclipse and lunar eclipse in the publication of Ling Xian, Ling Xian 120 CE. The sun is like fire and the moon like water. The fire gives out light and the water reflects it. Thus the moon's brightness is produced from the radiance of the sun, and the moon's darkness is due to the light of the sun being obstructed pi. 
The side which faces the sun is fully lit, and the side which is away from it is dark. The planets as well as the moon have the nature of water and reflect light. The light pouring forth from the sun does not always reach the moon owing to the obstruction pi of the Earth itself. This is called enshu, a lunar eclipse. When a similar effect happens with a planet we call it an oculation sing wei. when the moon passes across kuo the sun's path then there is a solar eclipse shi. The later Song dynasty scientist Shen Kuo 1031 CE used the models of lunar eclipse and solar eclipse in order to prove that the celestial bodies were round, not flat. This was an extension of the reasoning of Jing Fang and other theorists as early as the Han dynasty. In his Dream Pool Essays of 1088 CE, Shen related a conversation he had with the director of the Astronomical Observatory, who had asked Shen if the shapes of the sun and the moon were round like balls or flat like fans. Shen Kuo explained his reasoning for the former. If they were like balls they would surely obstruct each other when they met. I replied that these celestial bodies were certainly like balls. How do we know this? By the waxing and waning of the moon. The moon itself gives forth no light, but is like a ball of silver, the light is the light of the sun, reflected. When the brightness is first seen, the sun, light passes almost, alongside, so the side only is illuminated and looks like a crescent. When the sun gradually gets further away, the light shines slanting, and the moon is full, round like a bullet. If half of a sphere is covered with white powder and looked at from the side, the covered part will look like a crescent, if looked at from the front, it will appear round. Thus we know that the celestial bodies are spherical. When he asked Shen Kuo why eclipses occurred only on an occasional basis while in conjunction and opposition once a day, Shen Kuo wrote, I answered that the ecliptic and the moon's path are like two rings, lying one over the other, but distant by a small amount. If this obliquity did not exist, the sun would be eclipsed whenever the two bodies were in conjunction, and the moon would be eclipsed whenever they were exactly in opposition. But, in fact, though they may occupy the same degree, the two paths are not always near each other, and so naturally the bodies do not intrude upon one another. Equipment and innovation Armillary sphere Hun. The earliest development of the armillary sphere in China goes back to the 1st century BCE, as they were equipped with a primitive single-ring armillary instrument. This would have allowed them to measure the north polar distance, ku ji du the Chinese form of declination and measurement that gave the position in a shu, ru su du the Chinese form of right ascension. During the Western Han Dynasty 202 BC to 9 CE, additional developments made by the astronomers Luo Shaong, Luo Sha Hong Xiang Yu Wangren, and Zhang Shouchang Zhang Shouchang advanced the use of the armillary in its early stage of evolution. In 52 BCE, it was the astronomer Zheng Shouchang who introduced the fixed equatorial ring to the armillary sphere. In the subsequent Eastern Han Dynasty 23 CE period, the astronomers Fuan and Jia Kui added the elliptical ring by 84 CE. With the famous statesman, astronomer, and inventor Zhang Heng 78 CE, the sphere was totally completed in 125 CE, with horizon and meridian rings. It is of great importance to note that the world's first hydraulic i.e., water-powered armillary sphere was created by Zhang Heng, who operated his by use of an inflow clepsydra clock see Zhang's article for more detail. Abridged armilla Designed by famous astronomer Guo Shoujing in 1276 AD, it solved most problems found in armillary spheres at that time. The primary structure of abridged armilla contains two large rings that are perpendicular to each other, of which one is parallel with the equatorial plane and is accordingly called equatorial ring, and the other is a double ring that is perpendicular to the center of the equatorial ring, revolving around a metallic shaft, and is called right ascension double ring. The double ring holds within itself a sighting tube with crosshairs. When observing, astronomers would aim at the star with the sighting tube, whereupon the star's position could be deciphered by observing the dials of the equatorial ring and the right ascension double ring. A foreign missionary melted the instrument in 1715 CE. 
The surviving one was built in 1437 CE and was taken to what is now Germany. It was then stored in a French embassy in 1900, during the Eight Nation Alliance. Under the pressure of international public discontent, Germany returned the instrument to China. In 1933, it was placed in Purple Mountain Observatory, which prevented it from being destroyed in the Japanese invasion of China. In the 1980s, it had become seriously eroded and rusted down and was nearly destroyed. In order to restore the device, the Nanjing government spent 11 months to repair it. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Celestial Globe, Hunshang before Qing Dynasty. Besides star maps, the Chinese also made celestial globes, which show stars' positions like a star map and can present the sky at a specific time. Because of its Chinese name, it is often confused with the armillary sphere, which is just one word different in Chinese hun shang versus hun yi. According to records, the first celestial globe was made by Zheng Shouchang Zheng Shouchang between 70 BC and 50 BCE. In the Ming Dynasty, the celestial globe at that time was a huge globe, showing the 28 mansions, celestial equator and ecliptic. None of them have survived. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Celestial Globe Tianti in the Qing Dynasty. Celestial globes were named Tianti, Miriam celestial bodies, in the Qing Dynasty. The one in Beijing Ancient Observatory was made by Belgian missionary Ferdinand Verbiest in 1673 CE. Unlike other Chinese celestial globes, it employs 360 degrees rather than the 365.24 degrees which is a standard in ancient China. It is also the first Chinese globe that shows constellations near to the celestial south pole. The water-powered armillary sphere and celestial globe tower The inventor of the hydraulic-powered armillary sphere was Zhang Heng of the Han Dynasty. Zhang was well known for his brilliant applications of mechanical gears, as this was one of his most impressive inventions alongside his seismograph to detect the cardinal direction of earthquakes that struck hundreds of miles away. Started by Su Song, Su Song and his colleagues in 1086 CE and finished in 1092 CE, his large astronomical clock tower featured an armillary sphere, Hun Yi a celestial globe Hun Shang and a mechanical chronograph. It was operated by an escapement mechanism and the earliest known chain drive. However, 35 years later, the invading Yurchin army dismantled the tower in 1127 CE upon taking the capital of Kaifeng. The armillary sphere part was brought to Beijing, yet the tower was never successfully reinstated, not even by Su Song's son. Fortunately, two versions of Su Song's treatise written on his clock tower have survived the ages, so that studying his astronomical clock tower is made possible through medieval texts. <laughs> True north and planetary motion The polymath Chinese scientist Shen Kuo was not only the first in history to describe the magnetic needle compass, but also made a more accurate measurement of the distance between the pole star and true north that could be used for navigation. Shen achieved this by making nightly astronomical observations along with his colleague Wei Pu, using Shen's improved design of a wider sighting tube that could be fixed to observe the pole star indefinitely. Along with the pole star, Shen Kuo and Wei Pu also established a project of nightly astronomical observation over a period of five successive years, an intensive work that even would rival the later work of Tycho Brahe in Europe. Shen Kuo and Wei Pu charted the exact coordinates of the planets on a star map for this project and created theories of planetary motion, including retrograde motion. Foreign influences Indian astronomy Buddhism first reached China during the Eastern Han Dynasty, and translation of Indian works on astronomy came to China by the Three Kingdoms era 220 
However, the most detailed incorporation of Indian astronomy occurred only during the Tang dynasty 618 when a number of Chinese scholars—such as Yi Xing—were versed both in Indian and Chinese astronomy. A system of Indian astronomy was recorded in China as Juzi Li 718 CE, the author of which was an Indian by the name of Qutan Zita, a translation of Devanagari Gautama Siddha, the director of the Tang Dynasty's National Astronomical Observatory, the Astronomical Table of Signs by the Indian astronomer and mathematician Aryabhatan was translated into the Chinese Astronomical and Mathematical Book Treatise on Astrology of the Kaiyuan Era Kaiyuan Zhenjing, compiled in 718 CE during the Tang Dynasty. The Kaiyuan Zhenjing was compiled by Gautama Siddha, an astronomer and astrologer born in Chang'an, and whose family was originally from India. He was also notable for his translation of the Navagraha calendar into Chinese. Topic: <inaudible> Islamic astronomy in East Asia. Islamic influence on Chinese astronomy was first recorded during the Song dynasty when a Wei Muslim astronomer named Ma Yi's introduced the concept of seven days in a week and made other contributions. Islamic astronomers were brought to China in order to work on calendar making and astronomy during the Mongol Empire and the succeeding Yuan dynasty. The Chinese scholar Yelu Chusai accompanied Genghis Khan to Persia in 1210 and studied their calendar for use in the Mongol Empire. Kublai Khan brought Iranians to Beijing to construct an observatory and an institution for astronomical studies. Several Chinese astronomers worked at the Marifa Observatory, founded by Nasir al Din al Tusi in 1259 under the patronage of Hulagu Khan in Persia. One of these Chinese astronomers was Fu Mengchi, or Fu Meze. In 1267, the Persian astronomer Jamal ad Din, who previously worked at Mariga Observatory, presented Kublai Khan with seven Persian astronomical instruments, including a terrestrial globe and an armillary sphere, as well as an astronomical almanac, which was later known in China as the Wanian Li, 10,000 year calendar, or eternal calendar. He was known as Zama Luding. In China, where, in 1271, he was appointed by Khan as the first director of the Islamic Observatory in Beijing, known as the Islamic Astronomical Bureau, which operated alongside the Chinese Astronomical Bureau for four centuries. Islamic astronomy gained a good reputation in China for its theory of planetary latitudes, which did not exist in Chinese astronomy at the time, and for its accurate prediction of eclipses. Some of the astronomical instruments constructed by the famous Chinese astronomer Guo Shoujing shortly afterwards resemble the style of instrumentation built at Marifa. In particular, the simplified instrument Jianyi, and the large gnomon at the Gaocheng Astronomical Observatory show traces of Islamic influence. While formulating the Shoshili calendar in 1281, Shoujing's work in spherical trigonometry may have also been partially influenced by Islamic mathematics, which was largely accepted at Kublai's court. These possible influences include a pseudo-geometrical method for converting between equatorial and ecliptic coordinates, the systematic use of decimals in the underlying parameters, and the application of cubic interpolation in the calculation of the irregularity in the planetary motions. Emperor Taizu, R. 1368 to 1398 of the Ming Dynasty, 1328 to 1398, in the first year of his reign, 1368, conscripted Han and non-Han astrology specialists from the astronomical institute institutions in Beijing of the former Mongolian Yuan to Nanjing to become officials of the newly established National Observatory. That year, the Ming government summoned for the first time the astronomical officials to come south from the upper capital of Yuan. There were 14 of them. In order to enhance accuracy in methods of observation and computation, Emperor Taizu reinforced the adoption of parallel calendar systems, the Han and the Wei. In the following years, the Ming court appointed several Wei astrologers to hold high positions in the imperial observatory. They wrote many books on Islamic astronomy and also manufactured astronomical equipment based on the Islamic system. The translation of two important works into Chinese was completed in 1383, Zij 1366 and Al-Madkal Fi Sina'a Akam Al-Nujam, Introduction to Astrology 1004. In 1384, a Chinese astrolabe was made for observing stars based on the instructions for making multi-purposed Islamic equipment. In 1385, the apparatus was installed on a hill in northern Nanjing. 
Around 1384, during the Ming Dynasty, Emperor Zhu Yenzhong ordered the Chinese translation and compilation of Islamic astronomical tables, a task that was carried out by the scholars Mashiyihe, a Muslim astronomer, and Wu Bozong, a Chinese scholar official. These tables came to be known as the Weiwei Lifa Muslim System of Calendrical Astronomy, which was published in China a number of times until the early 18th century, though the Qing dynasty had officially abandoned the tradition of Chinese Islamic astronomy in 1659. The Muslim astronomer Yang Guangxian was known for his attacks on the Jesuits' astronomical sciences. <laughs> Jesuit activity in China The introduction of Western science to China by Jesuit priest astronomers was a mixed blessing during the late 16th century and early 17th century. The telescope was introduced to China in the early 17th century. The telescope was first mentioned in Chinese writing by Manuel Díaz the Younger who wrote his Tian Wen Lu in 1615. In 1626, Johann Adam Schall von Bell Tang Ruowang published the Chinese treatise on the telescope known as the Yuan Jing Shuo the far-seeing optic glass. The Chongzhen Emperor R1627 of the Ming Dynasty acquired the telescope of Johannes Terentius or Johann Schreck, Deng Yu Han in 1634, ten years before the collapse of the Ming Dynasty. However, the impact on Chinese astronomy was limited. The Jesuit China missions of the 16th and 17th centuries brought Western astronomy, then undergoing its own revolution, to China and—via Joao Rodriguez's gifts to Zheng Duan to Joseon Korea. After the Galileo affair early in the 17th century, the Roman Catholic Jesuit order was required to adhere to geocentrism and ignore the heliocentric teachings of Copernicus and his followers, even though they were becoming standard in European astronomy. Thus, the Jesuits initially shared an Earth-centered and largely pre-Copernican astronomy with their Chinese hosts i.e., the Ptolemaic Aristotelian views from Hellenistic times. The Jesuits such as Giacomo Rho, later introduced Tycho's geoheliocentric model as the standard cosmological model. The Chinese often were fundamentally opposed to this as well, since the Chinese had long believed from the ancient doctrine of Zanyi that the celestial bodies floated in a void of infinite space. This contradicted the Aristotelian view of solid concentric crystalline spheres, where there was not a void, but a mass of air between the heavenly bodies. Of course, the views of Copernicus, Galileo, and Tycho Brahe would eventually triumph in European science, and these ideas slowly leaked into China despite Jesuit efforts to curb them in the beginning. In 1627, the Polish Jesuit Michael Boim Bu -E introduced Johannes Kepler's Copernican Rudolphine tables with much enthusiasm to the Ming court at Beijing. In Adam Schall von Bell's Chinese written treatise of Western astronomy in 1640, the names of Copernicus Galileo and Tycho Brahe were formally introduced to China. There were also Jesuits in China who were in favor of the Copernican theory, such as Nicholas Smogoletsky and Wenceslaus Kurwitzer. However, Copernican views were not widespread or wholly accepted in China during this time. Ferdinand Augustin Hollerstein created the first spherical astrolabe as the head of the Imperial Astronomical Bureau from 1739 until 1774. The former Beijing Astronomical Observatory, now a museum, still hosts the armillary sphere with rotating rings, which was made under Hollerstein's leadership and is considered the most prominent astronomical instrument. While in Edo, Japan, the Dutch aided the Japanese with the first modern observatory of Japan in 1725, headed by Nakane Genke, whose observatory of astronomers wholly accepted the Copernican view. In contrast, the Copernican view was not accepted in mainstream China until the early 19th century, with the Protestant missionaries such as Joseph Edkins, Alex Wiley, and John Fryer. Famous Chinese astronomers Gan De Guo Shoujing Shen Kuo Shi Shen Su Song Xu Guangqi Yu Shi Zhang Heng Observatory Beijing Ancient Observatory Astro Observatory equals equals see also